First and foremost, we just want to welcome everybody for being here today. Uh, we're so glad that you guys are here. Uh, this is actually, if I'm not mistaken, our ninth mayor's luncheon that we kicked off this series this year. And we're so excited about what this event has become. It's really kind of brought out a lot of you young professionals out and, uh, you know, make, we see your young faces. We see, it's so exciting to see, well, all of us as the future leaders of Fort Worth to come together once a month, have lunch with the mayor. And as we just get introduced to some of our current leaders and some of the big things that are going on in our city. So um, we're really, really proud of our partnership between Steer Fort Worth and LYP. One of the things that I uh, definitely want to put out there, I'm Maury Padilla, I'm the chairman for the Latino Young Professional Organization. And hopefully within each table, there's an LYP representative that you can, if you have any questions about who we are, what we're trying to accomplish as an organization, please, please don't hesitate to ask any, of them, any, any one of us. Um, with that said, um, the next thing I just want to introduce, uh, Mayor Betsy Price is going to come up, uh, be coming up here. She's going to be presenting uh, our speakers for today. So please give a hand for Mayor Betsy Price. Actually, there were probably stairs on the other side, but I'm not known for my grace. So I just climb up. Uh, I grew up, you know, in horseback with brothers and riding uh, horses and bicycles. And sometimes high heels are not my shoe of choice. It's so good to see you all here. You all hear from me all the time, but uh, I just have to take just a second out of the program and thank each and every one of you for last Thursday's presentation. It was incredible, and the community is still talking about it. Several of you here presented, Sarah and Hannah, Jonathan are here, several of you presented. And it was a tribute to all of you as young leaders that all of our downtown leaders, our South Side and our So Seventh leaders, a lot of our, uh, both our police chief and fire chief, the city manager, stayed for the entire presentation. And I sat with Kay Granger Monday at a funeral, and Kay said, I am so sorry that I missed your young adults. She uh, revealed, she said, that is all anyone is talking about. So you deserve a big hand for your hard work on that. Fort Worth, I always say it, I'm kind of like a proud mama. With all of y'all, we're in great hands, and I'm very proud of what y'all have taken hold. Maury and LYP, y'all have done a great job. Rachel, wherever Rachel is, getting it going. And my staff, who's worked so hard on it, Keeman, Misty, Beth, everybody else, Callie. I don't know who all is here. Marianne. Marianne. Yeah, there's Marianne. Uh, Sandy. Where's Sandy? There she is. And Belinda's back there from... Sal and uh, and there's I didn't see you over there. There's Sal right there, our, our uh, council member for this district, and we're all still alive and well after yesterday's bu budget votes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do just a bit of housekeeping, and then I'll introduce our three outlaw guests, shall I say, or it's two outlaws and one distinguished guest, I think. And y'all will have to short, sort out who's who there. You know, we're kind of giving you a little breathing room now. Our, the next couple of months will be fun things. You have Kay Granger next month. It'll be really interesting to see what she has to say. Then we have uh, Jeff Bagan at DFW on November the 7th. And on November the 28th, we'll have our second annual celebration at Joe T's. Can you believe it's been a year? So I plan to come and bring some additional friends with you. This is kind of wind down celebration mode, but you are in no means dismissed. Your work will start again in January. Uh, today we have Dr. Andrew Walker from the Eamon Carter Museum. Andrew might not be the outlaw. He might be the good guy. Who's They're celebrating their 50th anniversary, and I have a hard time believing that Carter is 50 years old, the museum. It's incredible, and the work that they have done and continue to do for this community is phenomenal, and I think you'll enjoy hearing from him. We have Gary Brinkley, who is also the mayor of Saginaw. So he's Mayor Brinkley, who is with, the, for 13 years, has been with the Stockyard Station and Hickman Investments, and this is one of Holt Hickman's property, the museum in this, and has done wonderful things for us. And Gary is also a VP with our uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau. And then we have the only traitor in the room, the only true outlaw, David Dubois, who's our director for CBB. And we say that because David is leaving us and has taken a job in Dallas, but he is not competing with Fort Worth because he's smarter than that. 
So he's going to be bringing business. He's working for International, David Tim. International Association of Exhibitions and Events. So you got the title. And he'll be bringing business to Fort Worth in his new role. And he's promised us he wouldn't sell a shard, and I know he won't. So David, we're sorry you're leaving us, but we're delighted to have you. Gentlemen, we're so glad to have all three of you, and I'm going to let y'all sort out who's going to present first and how you're going to go. Thank you for being with us, and thank you for sharing today. Thank you, Mary Price. Um, I, I, I think I'm becoming an outlaw, slowly. I've been in Fort Worth now a little over a year and a half, and I've come from St. Louis, where I was um, the deputy director at the St. Louis Art Museum. And I have to tell you, when I thought about this topic today, which was really the impact of the Amon Carter as a representative of the Arts District, of the Cultural District, uh, what struck me first was what drew me here. What drew me from the position that I had uh, in St. Louis to this city that was unfamiliar to me in many regards, but the Amon Carter wasn't, and the Cultural District wasn't, because it is such a critical dimension, not only of the art world more generally, that Fort Worth distinguishes itself in a very dramatic way with the quality of those three art museums. That was really what kind of drew me. It gathered my attention. And over time, when I've thought about that in relationship to um, the idea of what, what is the impact of, of three major art museums in one small spit of land uh, in Fort Worth, is that it really can bring, it can, it can draw people here from other places. It's one of the great qualities um, of the arts, I think, um, certainly in, in Fort Worth. But I wanted to talk really briefly more generally before I get into the story of the Eamon Carter about the impact that the arts have generally within municipal, uh, mu municipal centers as well as uh, across the nation. Um, here in Tarrant County, um, many of you know I'm sure that uh, the arts, both performing and the fine arts, contribute more than $85 million to um, the overall income just within the county itself. Um, and if you were to extend that, of course, in the entire Metroplex, you can just continue to, to, to multiply that. And across the nation, um, that continues to sort of expand. And how you measure it is hard. How, what the impact is, is not just measured in dollars, but it's measured in experience. But one statistic that I thought I would just throw out because it kind of made me smile as a nerdy art historian who you know, spends his time looking at paintings, that um, overall, uh, across the nation, nearly 850 million on-site visits happen in museums every year. And that is more than all of the major league sporting events across this country together that actually in the museum visits, uh, uh, much to my surprise, that there are 850 million nerds out there like me um, <laughs> who enjoy looking at works of art. But if we could advance the slide. But I, I do really want to talk up, up today and focus in on the arts in Fort Worth um, as it's defined uh, in the Cultural District by the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art, the Kimball Museum, and the, Moder the Fort Worth Modern Museum um, of Art as well. And, and really begin to think about how do we measure that impact. Each one of these museums, like the Amon Carter, is as much a place, a destination for rich experience um, in the arts, but we're all businesses as well. We actually, have, we don't see our product as a sales product, but what we are really attempting to do uh, in adding to the experience of Fort Worth <coughs> citizens um, to increase visitorship, participation, the active participation that's not a passive kind of experience. And then how do we measure that impact within the community? What, are, what is our actual impact? Um, and what are the criteria that we bring forward in, in order to measure that? It's, I, I think we can advance. I don't know, I have to admit, I don't have my slide list here, so I'm not quite sure how this is gonna go. But um, one of the reasons I, I, I wanted to show this picture is that that first one's kind of stale. It kind of looks like these great architectural monuments for which they are um, in Fort Worth. It's incredible, uh, the, the internationally renowned architecture that exists right there in the cultural district between Philip Johnson, Louis Kahn, Tadao Ando, and uh, soon to be unveiled um, in a year or so, the Renzo Piano um, addition to the Kimball. 
But it's also, those are spaces that are activated, that part of our, our experience is to bring people to us to have a meaningful experience. That, again, you know, we don't, we're not selling something per se, but we're providing um, the environment for um, an experience. And it takes many, many people to make that happen. We have, just in the Amon Carter, uh, more than 100 employees, full FTE employees or full-time uh, equivalent employees, and then another 30 um, who are either part-time or volunteer. And so you, when you think about this uh, institution on the hill there, um, it is really a kind of beehive of activity um, across, uh, across all of the, the departments and divisions um, that we have. In our 50th anniversary year, which was in 2011, we saw, because of our focused sense of marketing, of getting exhibitions, of, of getting our word out there in a way that was very different, we actually went through a whole rebranding um, exercise, and we became the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. And I just have to ask you, did any of you notice last year the visibility through our billboards that we had? And you saw that kind of brand identity that we reinforced over and over and over again. And it actually, if you want to believe that that works uh, in a business model, what we saw was an increase of 20% in our visitorship over last year through those efforts, but also tying it to the, the tremendous impact over 50 years that not only the museum has had, but the Carter family um, in supporting uh, not just the museum, but also um, many other charitable um, endeavors throughout, uh, throughout Tarrant County. And I, it got me really to start thinking, and that, because that number that went up by 20%, we see a visitorship of about 120,000 people every year. The Kimball does bigger numbers than we do. And when you're a museum director, you love your neighbors, but you also are a little competitive with your neighbors as well. <laughs> um, I went to an executive training session where we, we were, they were teaching the nonprofit people to think about their competition as complementers rather than competitors. And I love that idea, but sometimes you're competitive. <laughs> but it, it got me to thinking, in, in that increase, which we're on track to continue, in other words, we got people in on that anniversary year, and that we're going to meet that again. But how do we increase that? Well, first of all, it is the quality of the experience. And when you, it, I think we can advance. Um, I just wanted to show another uh, vision of one of our evening events um, on, uh, um, at the Amon Carter. And then the next, uh, the next slide, please. Um, one of the, the, the aspects of that complementing and comp competition is really what's something that's happening this weekend um, called Day in the District. Uh, it's the seventh year that this has happened. It's really a demonstration of cooperation. Uh, the museums all come together, uh, not just the art museums, but the museums throughout the district, uh, to really offer an, an experience. And there's performing arts throughout. Um, the, the day as well, to draw more and more people. And it's, it's grown, and it's become a real demonstration of what Fort Worth can do when we all work together. That's the great complementing part of it. Um, so I encourage you, uh, if you don't have plans uh, for Saturday, um, to, to spend at least an hour or so going to all the museums, because they are all opened and free um, on that day. The next slide. But when I began to really think about the Eamon Carter and that increase, quality experience, we are free. This was an, an ad campaign this summer, uh, free admission, priceless art. We, we do offer this experience for free, but that doesn't really, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get more people just because it's free, right? And in fact, sometimes when you actually value something, you find that you get more uh, response. Um, and so it's something that we uh, uh, really think about um, as, a, as a nonprofit professional organization. But when you think of our visitorship, it cuts two ways. One is programmed visitorship. People we know are going to be there. And of that 120,000 people that come every year, 112,000 of our visitors are coming through programmed visitorship. And, and part of that, if we can have the next slide, you'll see is this is our program visitorship. You'll see how it has grown in the last 10 years, from when the new building opened in 2002 or 2001 or so uh, to 2011. You know, the increase of the, the way that we've been able to develop program visit, visits to the museum through our lifelong learning education programs, whether it's student tours, teacher programs, you can read it there, the increase is pretty remarkable. That's part of that 112,000 people. The next, the next slide. And it really is about making the collection and that, that this really priceless collection of American art 
um, that has grown uh, over those 50 years, relevant and accessible, but tailored to the needs of those audiences that we identify. So every fourth grader in the fourth Fort Worth ISD comes to the Eamon Carter for an experience that's tied to their curriculum. That's over 16,000 students um, every year. And we see, as I said, uh, you know, through all of our programs, nearly 112,000. And it extends, the next slide, to our, our adult programs as well. I mean, we really have built this on a lifelong learning model. So from age one to age 99, uh, we, we provide an experience that's targeted and tailored to, prov to be quality. The next slide. But my, that competitive spirit in me is really beginning to look at what is going to make any one of you decide when you wake up on a Saturday morning or when you're planning your Thursday evening to say, you know what, I want to go to the Eamon Carter. I mean, what would it be? Anybody? Wine. Wine? No, no, that's, that's a great answer, actually. That is a great answer, in a way, because we don't necessarily do that. Certainly the modern does it, the Kimball does it, in, in, a, in, a, in a very specific way. They both, I learned, I should know this, they both have liquor license. We, have, we do not have a liquor license at Damon Carter. We're going to fix that, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> please, please don't tell Ruth that I said that. <laughs> but um, but there, is, there is a benefit for beginning to tailor that unprogrammed visitorship in different ways. What is it that people want? Well, one of the others, and I think about this as a movie, and I'm going to tie this up because I know I'm way over 10 minutes, is, is what we do and offer in our special exhibitions. You know, I, you, it's always like the New Yorker who doesn't go to the Empire State Building because it's there. Well, it's often permanent collections are like that in art museums as well. It's like, you don't necessarily, oh, I can do that another time. But if you know, for example, if we can go back one, I'm sorry, real quick. If you know that the masterworks from the Phillips Collection of American Art from Winslow Homer to Mark Rothko, a hundred works of art from Washington, D.C., of some, one of the great American collections is going to be at the Eamon Carter for a short period of time, and it's free, hopefully that's going to impact your decision. The better and the quality of our exhibition programs is one way to begin driving people in an unprogrammed way to our museum. So I just wanted to show you a few things that are uh, and to entice you, hopefully. So the Phillips Collection and then Coming in the early of 2014, um, uh, we're having a, a major exhibition put together by the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, looking at the relevance and the representation of food in American art from the federal period all the way up until, um, until the pop artists of the 1960s. And as well, bringing masterworks like Edward Hopper's um, Nighthawks um, at the Art Institute or Norman Rockwell's Freedom from Want. You know, these are experiences that don't happen very often as works of art in North Texas. And yet, here we are uh, going to be bringing them. And then the next slide and last. Um, but also exhibitions that we generate, committed to the, the research and the presentation um, of the American West, certainly, um, although we do much more than just that. But we are uh, developing an exhibition about uh, George Caleb Bingham. Many of you may not have heard him, but he's one of, one of the great 19th century American artists. If I showed you his work um, broadly, you would recognize it um, because it's so, it is so ingrained in, in, our, in our historical memory. Um, and yet, uh, uh, it's not as well known by the artist's name. But we will be bringing uh, his major works um, um, of the paintings of the river uh, in the 19th century. And then an exhibition that opens this fall, um, uh, or next fall, I'm sorry, in 2013, uh, looking at the history of color in the medium of photography. Uh, we have at the Eamon Carter the second largest collection in the country of American photography, um, a little known fact that many of you may not have known. But if you're lovers of photography, um, this is one of the destinations, not only in North Texas, um, but in all of the country to come. So I just wanted to give you a little bit flavor of those two aspects of our audiences and how we try to tailor um, quality experience in order to continue to make that impact um, through the culture and the arts uh, in our community. So thank you so much. Good afternoon, I guess, Mayor. I'm the outlaw. <laughs> you know, when I announced that I was leaving about, 10, about eight weeks ago, it seems like eight months ago, um, I've had a lot of people calling me traitor, so uh, I'm kind of getting used to that. But my wife keeps tapping me on the shoulder saying, it's OK, dear, so we'll move forward. Uh, Andrew, thank you. And I tell you what, uh, I'm going to share some numbers with you. And I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the economic development of, 
of uh, certainly tourism, meetings, conventions, trade shows, and visitations into our city. But Andrew sparked some thoughts, uh, and I wrote down some numbers. In the cultural district alone, outside of the million plus, well, it depends on whether, as Brad Barnes will tell you, that go to the Stock Show Rodeo every year, anywhere from 800,000 to a million, uh, over three million people visit our museums, including the Cowgirl, and all of the activities that take place at all the equestrian shows. So in total, in that small area that is just over here, a couple miles, over four million visitors a year enjoy the, uh, the festivities and all the activities and the venues over in that area. Downtown, Sundance Square in the downtown area, over 10 million visitors a year. Uh, now, uh, some of them obviously uh, overlap and come out to the cultural district, and Gary just told me the updated number for the stockyards is two and a half million. So if you add that together, it's a pretty healthy environment that we enjoy in the great city of Fort Worth. So I'm going to kind of take you through an overview of, of what is a Convention and Visitors Bureau and a DMO. Brian, if you can go to the first slide. Um, we interchange what a CVB is with a DMO. DMO. A couple years ago, we changed the nomenclature of our profession to start focusing on destination marketing versus just convention and visitors. So we're kind of uh, moving, kind of morphing towards a DMO um, nomenclature. Uh, I'll mention the purpose of the CVB, past achievements, and how you all can play a role. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 1896, uh, the first CVB was founded in Detroit. They got together. Uh, four or five ladies and gentlemen, and I'll just say it, there were probably just five guys back then, that got together from Toledo, Ohio, and Detroit, and maybe you know, Chicago and a few other cities, because they wanted to share leads of, of various festivals and trade events that would go on throughout the country. So that's how that started. Today there's over 1,500 CVBs or DMOs just in North America, uh, let alone another 300 internationally. And they go by a bunch of different names, which kind of, uh, we're trying to morph ourselves towards, uh, towards a little bit more consistency in what we do across our, uh, our industry. What is the CVB DMO? We are the uh, umbrella organization that markets, promotes, and provides services to the city of Fort Worth. In this city, we are a 501c6 organization, nonprofit. We sign a, a service agreement uh, with the mayor and council that uh, right now we're in year five of, uh, of a five-year contract. So they outsource that to us as a sales and marketing services organization for the city of Fort Worth. We work very closely with the major chambers of commerce to make sure that we're attracting visitors from all multicultural sects, all business segments. And so there's a, there's a whole uh, economic development need that, uh, that the CVB and our various chambers help to work on together. Uh, we are funded, uh, I think the next slide, Brian. We are funded uh, predominantly from hotel tax. So those of us who live in the city of Fort Worth do not uh, fund or underwrite the, the efforts of the Convention and Visitors Bureau. 15% uh, is charged, I think it's the next slide if you would, Brian. 15% is charged, uh, I know it's in there somewhere. 15% is charged to every guest, so if a guest pays $100 for a hotel room to stay at the X Hotel or Y Hotel, uh, an additional $15 uh, is added on to that. Um, nine of it comes to the city of Fort Worth. That helps to pay for bonds of the convention center expansion, helps to pay for uh, a lot of different things that happen under what's called an enterprise fund. Uh, right now, uh, Mr. Slaughter and I helped uh, manage on behalf of the mayor and council a $30 million enterprise fund, which also includes all of the equestrian uh, uh, event venues here in the Will Rogers complex as well as the convention center downtown and certainly the sales and marketing efforts of the CVB. So our job at the bottom here is to be the voice of the hospitality industry to the community and the local government. In my current role I probably sit on seven or eight different boards because it is very important that whether I'm on the Hispanic board, the Black Chamber board, uh, sister cities, the Arts Council, whatever it may be that we have an integrated approach and a consistent messaging to make sure that the visitors outside of our city, be it in the state and the region, and certainly uh, nationally and internationally, uh, that we have consistent voice um, in talking about what we do and have here in Fort Worth. Uh, this is our branding. Uh, a couple years ago, we tweaked it a little bit. We are indeed the city of cowboys and culture. 
Um, always fun to balance the cowboys and culture aspect, right, uh, Andrew, to make sure that we are, are uh, sensitive to the incredible economic impact that our arts community, uh, be it live or, um, or otherwise, bring to, uh, to the city of Fort Worth, as well as uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Gary Brinkley and, and the Menix and others at Billy Bob and, and the great stockyards continue to make sure that we, we do balance the, the wonderful branding of the city of cowboys and culture. Next, please. So here's our mission, which uh, I've kind of gone over. If you can go to the next slide. Our structure, as I mentioned, is uh, that we are uh, solely funded through hotel occupancy tax as a C6. We have 33-member board, nine-member executive committee. The city manager, Tom Higgins, sits on our executive committee. Um, one of our councilmen, uh, Joel Burns, sits on the executive committee. So we obviously have very valuable input from the ladies and gentlemen uh, on mayor and council that uh, provide us guidance. And certainly they are our client because as a service organization, we service uh, uh, a very long, probably 30-page contract with the city of Fort Worth and make sure that we, we uh, report out every, uh, every quarter properly. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the occupancy tax, as it's paid, um, our oversight predominantly is the convention center, the Will Rogers, and certainly to make sure that, uh, uh, Mayor, we, uh, we get enough money in every month to, uh, to, to pay those bills and make sure that the, the expansion of the convention center, which happened many years ago, is certainly paid for uh, by hotel occupancy and uh, probably 96 percent of the, the ladies and gentlemen and families who stay in hotels are from outside this region. So once again it really does help to supplement the, the, uh, the great quality of life we have here in Fort Worth. Uh, the next please. Uh, just some historical perspective in 2003 uh, in order to uh, to renovate and expand the convention center at $75 million. Bonds were floated and those are paid by 2%. That 9%, 2% go directly to paying those bonds. The other 7% go to the enterprise fund. Um, obviously, we had incredible growth in our downtown hotel product with the Omni, the Sheraton, and the Embassy Suites. Uh, we've added an incredible number of restaurants in the downtown area, the, the south side area. Uh, West 7th, certainly here in the stockyards. Um, as I was explaining last night in an event that, that we were at, uh, when Mayor Moncrief and Council, I think, uh, Sal, you were on the Council then as well, back in 2007 when I went in in my first meeting with uh, Mayor Moncrief and, uh, and uh, uh, city manager and staff at the time and asked for a $2 million increase after they called security and almost moved me out of Mayor Moncrief's <laughs> office, um, we were able to convince them at that time that the city of Fort Worth was poised to be this wonderful destination that we all love and enjoy. And we were ready to have a party. And the bar was set up, the food was out, everything was ready to happen. And uh, the chairman at the time, who was a banker, said, you know, we don't have enough money to pay for invitations. So we need an additional $2 million, which will help us to add staff, and not only in sales, but in marketing. For all of your business that you, that you work for, if you don't drive that top line, nothing else is going to happen. So that's what we focus on every day. So great historical perspective to the city. I, I was uh, mentioning uh, last night at an event that uh, we've helped grow the collective we, the venues, the restaurant tours, the ladies and gentlemen from all the various chambers, the uh, mayor and council, we have been able to grow the room tax generation from $15 million to $20 million and in uh, five years and not ever have to go back to our local taxpayer base to help us grow that business, which is so valuable to all of us. Next, please. The economic impact. Uh, we host in, in downtown alone in terms of um, out-of-town visitors. And once again, uh, these are people who stay in hotels that we can track. 5.5 million and with an economic impact of $1.3 billion. Our CVB staff, the two ladies, raise your hand, that are part of our staff here, that are part of your young professional group, help us uh, uh, with 30 other staff associates to, uh, to support, serve, book support and service over 300 meetings and conventions held annually. Uh, it is estimated that approximately 17,000 jobs are supported by the meeting convention tourism business in our city with certainly uh, a very important number. Direct earnings from the hospitality employment exceed $453 million a year. We call it kind of an invisible industry. I know you all love it when you see, uh, when you're walking down Main Street 
or walking down exchange and you see people with badges, you go, all oh, these tourists in town, all these conventioneers, they help us drive the economy because about a third of the reason that restaurants and bars stay open is because of out-of-town visitors and convention attendees that come to enjoy our great city. These are just some results that have happened from calendar 09 through 2012. And as you can see, some beautiful increases, uh, not only in the number of conventions that we've been able to host, meeting, meetings, conventions, and trade shows, but also the number of attendees. The big spike, as you can see in 11, was, uh, was our Ice Bowl, I mean our Super Bowl <laughs> week. Uh, but Mayor, we did, we did kind of smoke the other city to the east, Dallas, where, you know, I think uh, our great team in the city of Fort Worth cleared the streets within uh, about 12 hours, and I, I was slipping and sliding in Dallas for three days when I had to go over there for, for events. But we're very proud of these results, and, and how can you all get involved? Uh, Brian, the next slide. Um, a lot of these conventions that you see here, I, we just listed some of the major conventions that we host every year. We have uh, some annuals like Kenneth Copeland Ministries, 4th of July week, 8,000 people every year uh, take over downtown. Wonderful ladies and gentlemen and families. Premier Design uh, every summer. Um, a lot of these conventions happen, but they happen in a lot of ways because the local residents of Tarrant County and especially Fort Worth, they'll call us and say, I'm on the board of directors of the American Association of Short French People, <laughs> or tall French people like me. And they'll say, I found out in an executive committee meeting last week that they're looking at the middle of the country for 2016. I'm going to send the RFP to you. We would not have received that lead if it wasn't for that lady or gentleman who sat on that board for his or her, her professional association that helps us generate leads that then put our salespeople to work and try to close business. Uh, so we have community partnership programs and, and certainly the program I just mentioned, Bring Meetings Home is not unlike what we do in the great city of Fort Worth to make sure that people enjoy uh, everything that we have. Um, we, our, our number one uh, referral of bringing visitors into the city of Fort Worth are people like yourself, 750,000 ladies and gentlemen and kids who live in the city that say, you need to come here for vacation next spring. You don't need to go down to Florida for spring break. You need to come and enjoy the great city of Fort Worth. So um, I think that might be it, Brian. Um, I thank you, and uh, I'll stand around for any questions if there are some afterwards. Thank you. Gary's really the unofficial mayor of the Stockyards, too. <laughs> no, 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 it's supposed to be Steve. No, that's Steve Murray, Murray, and that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I have to do the cleanup. Steve does the partying part. We work together very, very well. Uh, my pleasure to be with you all today. I, uh, I've been here for a long time. It turned out like that. It ended up being a little over 14 years now after a 13-year career in mall management. David talked about the macro, and I'll talk to you about the micro. Are you aware that the only public property in the stockyards is the Coliseum? Everything else here is privately owned. I manage about 55 acres, and our number one partner, Mr. Hickman, has interest in several other properties, so we roughly manage about 108 of the 125 acres of the district. Now, we manage as a quasi-governmental agency, and the reason we do that is so that people don't know that it's not part of the city of Fort Worth. We want that perception. Uh, especially if you're from Europe, people from Europe assume that it's part of the government. You know, we had the International Downtown Association here last year, and uh, it was really funny because I was talking to them and I wasn't communicating with them. And finally, finally one of the, the guys who was with me said, they don't understand what you're saying. You don't work for the government, you don't work for the city, you don't work for the state. I said, no, I work for private industry. And he goes, but these are public buildings. And then it dawned on me, they're used to everything being public over there. And so it's a different way of doing it. We want people to think it's part of the city. It's, real, it's a real easy sell. When I use the term we, I'm going to use the term we as a collective stockyards. And I will confess that I am very biased about what we've done at Stockyard Station. And, uh, but I strive for inclusion. Strive. Uh, we recognized the tenure, about 10 years ago, we recognized a growing tenure in historical uh, tourism, and we jumped on that as our future. According to the statewide preservation, citywide uh, preservation plan adopted in July 2003, uh, historic tourism adds more th to the economy. City report shows historic tourism spends $29 a day more than the average tourist and is more than likely to come from somewhere out of state. You know, the stockyards. When you look at all these rankings, 
four stockyards typically ranks about number eight in attractions. And if you condense the Alamo and the Riverwalk and SeaWorld together, we're always in the top five after that. Um, so I always condense it when I'm talking. <laughs> top five. We see about two and a half million visitors a year. Yeah. And, and, and we get them from all over the world. I, I managed them all in Cleburne, Texas for eight years. And it was with John Hancock Real Estate. And it was a good deal, but I wanted to come back home. I saw more people here the first week I worked than eight years in Cleburne, Texas. And it's so funny because you'll see a blonde haired blue eyed person walking by and you say howdy and they'll go, Guten Tag. And it just, it, it just, but it's so awesome to be walking the street. We've had a bunch of French people here recently. And to hear these people just going off about the whole stockyards. And it's, no, because they're leaving their credit card money around. It's great. But it's just so fun to watch that. Another visual I have is um, we, had a, we had an event going on and we had the streets blocked and a tour bus full of Asians got off. And I think they were from Japan, to be honest with you. And they were all in their business suits. They always walked around in business suits, white shirts, and dark ties. And they all went to the first table they saw and bought the cheapest straw cowboy hat you could find. And all 43 of them walked around the whole event with their cowboy hat on and their business suits and felt so much part of the stockyards. It was great. Uh, usually on any given day, you'll find about 60% of the people on the street are from the area. And about 40% are outside the metro area. Now that switches back and forth. But every time you do a stop intercept, it's a 60-40 split. We... Uh, we provide education programs here in the stockyards for about 25,000 kids a year. And regrettably, most of those aren't from Fort Worth. They're from the outline. They're Azles, the Saginaws, a lot from Arlington because they have the money to travel. We do the Frontier Fort Day every year to celebrate our city as a fort. And with that event, we're able to bring in a little over 4,000 students from uh, Fort Worth ISD. So that's a good program. We've also had an uh, evolution over the last 10 years or so about this perception of the stockyards. I need an honest opinion. How many of you grew up thinking the stockyards is where you tested your fake ID and all the drunks hung out? How many? Okay. You're not going to own up to it? Well, we lost that generation, to be honest with you, because we didn't have the best of reputations because the stockyards wasn't taken care of. We've turned that around now. And the best thing that's happened to us has been the explosion in the Metroplex because we've had so many people move in and this is their new home and they don't know where to fit in or how to fit in and the stockyards and our distinct culture as a Western destination, they can relate to it. it. May not be who they are or what they are, but they can relate to it and they're bringing in all their friends and all their family that show up. The Northeast Tarrant County Corridor, the Grapevine, the Colleyville, the South Lake, those are great for the stockyards. Those people are, are transients. They move in, they move out, and they, and they don't have an identity when they're here and they can really relate to the stockyards. We, uh, the last uh, ball game that we had here, there was a group setting in Risky's eating at the bar and I just happened to listen and, and they're talking about, oh yeah, well they do this here and you do that there and they do the cattle drives and Billy Bob's and I'm like, they don't look like us and they don't sound like us. And they said, yeah, we moved in like four years ago and we found this place and we just love coming here. There's your Northeast Tarrant County again. It's just really, really good for us. Another huge success for us in the stockyards is Jerry Jones' world over at Cowboy Stadium. I tell you, those college ball games they bring in, not just Super Bowl was great, but those college ball games, God, we love the SEC. Those people are crazy, and they spend money. Oh, the, the LSUs and the Alabamas, I mean, just, just can't lose when you have an SEC coming through here. Uh, several years back, and it's just how we have evolved as the stockyards and moving up the the top of mind and the perception of you got to stop here. When uh, Tennessee won the national championship out in Tucson at the Fiesta Bowl six, seven years ago, we were getting ready for the four o'clock cattle drive. Eight buses pulled up and unloaded, and they were Tennessee fans. And they said, well, you know, we heard about the stockyards and cattle drive. We wanted to stop by and see it. So they pulled and unloaded over 200 and something people here for the four o'clock cattle drive. And every one of them had to buy a match cover or something to take with them from being in Fort Worth. Um, since I've been here, we've overseen the redevelopment of Stockyard Station, about six, added 6,100 square feet inside, another 55 redeveloped. We developed the High Place Hotel. 
And it was originally a Marisuite. I don't know if some of y'all may or may not remember that. And you know, things happen quickly in, de in development. I'd spent six and a half years finding the right partner and then the right flag, and it took another year to do it. So that hotel that you know, took seven and a half years, and everybody goes, why didn't you do that sooner? You <laughs> always hear that, right? Mr. Bass was here for a presentation. I was congratulating him on Sunday at Square, and he said, son, you spend hundreds of million dollars and wait 20 years, you can be an overnight success. <laughs> The purchase of this collection that you see here, the three different collections, um, I was able to work with the Hickman family to get that and then develop this building out. We developed the livery back there and then we spun it off to somebody else. And let me tell you, the livery was great for me personally because at the first started here, it was a very difficult job and very frustrating trying to figure out all the pieces. So at about two o'clock in the afternoon, I'd call down the livery and say, saddle up a horse. And I'd go out on the river for about two hours, or an hour there, an hour and back, just hand it off to a wrangler, they'd take care of it, come back, and you could work till eight o'clock at night, free and clear. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, we were also on our second time of refreshing the Livestock Exchange building. So a lot of it we do is special events. You know, we saw the, the decline and the, the elimination of Pioneer Days and Chisholm Trail, but we also saw the creation of what I said, the Frontier Fort Days, the Labor Day concerts, Willie Nelson bringing his 4th of July concert here, Christmas in the Stockyards, and one of our best events is kind of obscure. It's Cowtown Goes Green. That's our St. Patrick's Day celebration. It's all family-oriented, fun, and you can't get on the street for the cattle drive. Some of the one-off events we've done is the uh, Red Bull X Fighters. Did any of y'all get to come out for that? Yeah, they, set up a, they built a stadium on our property for 25,000 people to sit and watch motorcycles do flips. Um, when, when Red Bull has real money and, uh, and they're fun, fun, fun people, uh, they were looking for a venue and they saw Fort Worth and they really liked it and they really liked Cowboys. And so the stockyards as part of the Fort Worth culture all worked well for their branding. And so they came out and we showed them such a good time. This is the first time they've ever come to America. They do 680 a year and they've never been to America. It's all in Europe and South America. They had such a good time, unprecedentedly, they went back to the same location and, and had such a good time that the next round, we were on the final list. And they decided not to come back to America, but if they ever do, we are on that short list. We also did a Cincy event, served last like summer, it was 104 when they showed up at that convention. So we set up water stations and serviced about 10,000 people for the day. They had such a good time, they spent the whole week out here. Thank you for that, David, by the way. Another real cool event was the International Pow Wow Travel Expo. Dallas spent thousands of dollars to fly these people from all over the world to talk about tourism in Texas. We set up one night out here on Exchange Avenue, blew them all away. So not that we were proud of that, it's just what we do. And you, most of you probably know, we have a remarkable public-private partnership with the City of Fort Worth HERD program. You know, it's iconic to the city and to tourism for Fort Worth. And I've been fortunate enough to be on the inception of it when we're trying to negotiate the original contract with the city on how this was all going to work. And then through the transition over to the CVB, which has been very, very good for the CVB and the, and the herd because it's just a phenomenal marketing tool to market the city. Last year we saw over 72, 700, I'm sorry, 720,000 people on the street for the cattle drives. And you say, why 11 o'clock, 11.30 and 4 o'clock? Well, originally the train from Grapevine would come over. And so this was, when it worked great, it was phenomenal. But the train would show up at 11, 15, 11, 20, go across the street, put water in its tanks, come back across the street, blow its steam off, and as it cleared the track, the herd would come back the other way. And you just see people, it was a stimulation overload. I mean, it just it was wonderful. Grapevine's schedule has changed, and so they don't do that as much. And we knew we had a lot of people here, but it was kind of hard to count them because they were all over. And so we could see that about 2 o'clock people left. So we set the last cattle drive at 4 o'clock to keep them around. And you'll go out there at 11.15. The street will just fill up with people, and it'll dissipate. And at about 3.35, you'll start seeing a few, but about 3.45, here they'll all come. They'll come out of wherever they're at on the street, and then they'll dissipate. So it's a great way for us to account for who is here and who hasn't been here. Stockyard Station itself personally puts in about 150000 in in-kind 
We are the staff that secures the street for the cattle drive, and we also let them have all of our facilities. Stockyard Station alone averages five media contacts a week, and there's a lot more that we don't even know until it hits the press or the internet that they've been here. And a large part of that is due to, obviously, the cattle drive. We know that that popularity won't last forever, but trust me that we work very diligently to address every concern. When somebody says, we're coming, can we meet with you? Absolutely, you can meet with us. Can we take a picture of that? Absolutely, you can take a picture of that. We work very hard, well with the press to make sure they get whatever story they need so that it gets printed. So what's next? Stockyard Station, our Billy Bob partners, formed an association and master plan in 2009, the 108 acres that we managed, and that plan was for the next 40 years. Regrettably, the economy slowed down a little bit, and we weren't able to get any of those projects off the ground yet, but they're all ready to go. The plan was so good that the American Planners Association regionally gave us an award, and the plan won a state award at um, American Planners Association. The growth potential for what Stockyard is going to be is phenomenal. It just takes a little bit more time, a little bit more money. The next phase is going to be pretty easy, but the second phase is going to be a little more difficult because we're going to have to add structured parking to handle the volumes of people that are coming down. They say that if you like what you do, you never work a day in your life. I've worked about 20 days in the 14 years I've been here, so I love it here. It's a great place to work. I love the fact that that the city is very proud of what we do and that we can continue to deliver a product that the city's proud of. So, thank y'all.